Thank you for being with us tonight as we continue our study of the Jesus Principles and the practice of joy. No doubt, in the Beatitudes, you have the most basic principles of the kingdom of God. Here we have the greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher who ever lived. And so when we follow those basic principles, our lives become more blessed. We have more joy, more abundant life. And so that's what we're studying on Sunday nights. Thank you for being with us. We've talked about the perfect number, eight, and why eight is significance, as it suggests newness of life. We talked about the perfect setting that inspires and elevates our imagination. We've talked about the connection between these eight Beatitudes, that they form a kind of spiritual stairway that are drawing us closer to God, to the heart of God, to the mind of God, to the kingdom of God, until finally you're no longer a visitor, but you become his temple, a holy dwelling place of the Lord, as you believe and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to begin to discuss the particular Beatitudes themselves. And we're going to talk about number one through number four. So we'll look at the first half. The significance of this grouping is that, that it builds in thought to explain to us the process of joy, the process of spiritual growth, the process of spiritual transformation. So Jesus is telling us, let me explain to you how this works. I'd like for us to uh, read these together, and then we'll begin. Over in the book of Matthew chapter 5, it says, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Now, we have the first four. The poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, and those who hunger and thirst. And I think that's a special grouping. He starts by telling us the process of joy. He'll continue by telling us the priority of joy. And then finally, he'll tell us about the permanence of joy. How do you protect your joy? So the first that we're going to look at is blessed are the poor in spirit. And when you think about poor, it means you have less of something rather than more. When he says poor in spirit, he's not talking about blessed are people without the Holy Spirit. He's talking about people who have too much of the human spirit. That is, they have a very defensive and protective ego that's, that's blocking learning and growth. It's interfering. Go with me to the book of James. Because in James chapter 1, in verses 19 down through 21, I think you'll begin to understand what he's talking about here. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear. Be humble enough to hear. Shun that hubris, shed that conceit, that arrogance, that know-it-all attitude that makes it impossible for God to fill your heart and soul. Be quick to hear, slow to speak or to argue, and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, he says, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. I think he's telling us, receive, be receptive, be inquisitive, be, be curious. Open yourself to the information God wants to give you that will accomplish 
transformation. You need to know Jesus. You need to know his teachings. And there's a special blessing that he mentions if you do. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom. It's talking about the reign of God, the rule of God in your life. When you listen to him and you're open to his influence, you see, this is where all of change begins. It begins with humility. And so the idea of the kingdom of God is, is, is really twofold. On one hand, it may suggest becoming a Christian. If we go over to the book of Colossians, we read in Colossians in chapter 1, beginning in verse 13, he says, not Philippians, but uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Do you see the point here? Uh, that, that as you become a Christian, you become a citizen of the kingdom. You're out of the kingdom of darkness, the domain ruled over by Satan, the deceiver, and you are brought into this kingdom of knowledge and wisdom and truth and the blessings that flow from that. You get redemption. You get forgiveness. So what we want is to become a Christian. You can't become a Christian if you won't listen to the truth about Jesus. He is the Son of God. If you won't listen... Uh, to the conditions upon which we receive his blessings that come to us through his blood sacrifice at Calvary. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Will I listen not to what men say, but to what Jesus says? If, I, if I'll do that, I can become a Christian. But maybe it's talking also about not only entering and belonging to the kingdom, but, but evidencing a life that is appropriate for one who is a citizen of the kingdom. So that people who look at you, it sends a message to them when they see your life. This is a life ruled by God. I think maybe it's both of these ideas. It's the joy of the beginning, and it's the joy of the end, the purpose, the objective of becoming more Christ-like, more pleasing to God, as we not only are saved from our past sins, but we continue to hear the message of Christ, and we begin to be transformed by His teachings. It starts with being poor in spirit, and then... We're told, blessed are those who mourn. You start with humility. And then you need some honesty. And honesty can be painful. When we think about mourning, this is the pain of acknowledging what is not working in your life. It's not just a mild dislike, it's a, it's, a, it's a revulsion. I don't desire that old life. I want a new life. I want a, a different life. And I mourn because of what I've missed out on. Some people think you become a Christian, you're going to give up joy. No, you've been missing out on joy. And maybe I mourn not just for what I've missed out on, but also some of the hurt that I brought into the lives of people I love. It is, it is the mourning of acknowledging my part and some problems I've had with my spouse or with my parents or any other individual. It's acknowledging that. 
Because only when I'll go through the pain of, of self-honesty can I really turn the corner, really turn the corner. Now, when you go over the book of 2 Corinthians, it's so beautiful as it talks about our Heavenly Father. And it tells us in verses 3 and 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. The special blessing of those who mourn is they shall be comforted. And Jesus promises this because this is God's specialty, mercy and comfort. You get the mercy and comfort of forgiveness. But you also get the comfort of a far better life. You get healing in your relationships because you, you stop hurting them. You own up to your part of the problem, your need for growth, your desire to change. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. But now, blessed are are the meek. Now, what we're talking about here is the steadiness of self-control. This is a little bit different from humility. What he's talking about is self-discipline, that God has given to us a free will and this God-given power to make choices in accordance with what I've been hearing, in accordance with the purpose that I made to change my life, to repent, and to live for God. So I need meekness in my life. You know, an unruly life is just the opposite of meekness. An unruly life is a life of unhappiness because when you make decisions, they're all based on the short-term pleasure it can bring, and pleasure is not joy. On the other hand, Jesus says, let me tell you the secret to a blessed life. It is self-restraint. That's what meekness is talking about, self-restraint. Now, if I will be meek, the Bible says that I can inherit the earth. Isn't that an interesting expression? You know, when you go back in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 37 and verse 11, we find this phrase used. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. I think the idea of inheriting the land, it's a, it's a proverbial expression that God had promised the land and all of its fruits and all of its blessings. And so it's just, a, it's just an expression talking about what you will inherit, that is what you will receive from God. You're going to receive the very best life. You're going to thrive. You're going to flourish. And the chief characteristics that he mentions in Psalm 37 and verse 11 is delight and peace. You're going to delight in this abundant peace. This delight reminds me of joy. This is the practice of joy. But in the Old Testament, the idea of peace was shalom. It wasn't just the absence of some conflict with another individual. It was well-being. It was health and wholesomeness. Of a, It's the sweet fruits of a godly life, a well-ordered life, a life lived in harmony with the will of God. And I think that's what he says that you and I can enjoy. I think to be meek, first of all, talks about composure. It means that I'm not acting out impulsively. I don't live by impulse, I live by integrity. I don't live by whims, I live by values. I have composure, but it's not just composure. Because meekness is also this holy determination 
that I will do constructive things. I will make constructive changes, goal-oriented behaviors that are going to uh, honor God and that are going to, uh, going to please Him. Well, do you see how this process is working? It starts with this humility that makes us open to the Word and will of God. We mourn. That is, we have remorse, regret over our past life lived out of harmony with His will. And now we bring our lives under His control by exercising the volition, the choice, the power of choice that He gives us to put away the past and pursue the dream life that Jesus makes possible. See, that brings us to the fourth of these Beatitudes. In the fourth Beatitude, blessed are those who hunger, hunger and thirst after righteousness. And what we're talking about here is the positive side. Mourning is the negative side that enables the positive side. And hungering and thirsting after righteousness, what is right, is the positive side. So in other words, when you become a Christian, uh, in order to do that, there are things that you need to eliminate. That's mourning. And there are things that you need to cultivate. That's hungering and thirsting. And just as the body yearns for food and yearns for water, we ought to have some spiritual craving that that the incentive for completing holiness is craving holiness. First comes the desire, and then comes the dedication. So there's the, the combination of these ideas. Over in the Gospel of John in the sixth chapter, you remember a wonderful discussion that Jesus was having with people right after he fed the 5,000. You remember they were looking for Jesus the next day, and they couldn't find him. So they went in search. It says in verse 25, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they came to him. Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate, you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. Well, as he began to talk about this, they said, Sir, give us this bread always. Listen to how Jesus responded in verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Who, whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. You know, the special blessing of those who hunger and thirst after righteousness is that they will be satisfied. Jesus says, if you'll come to me, you'll never hunger, you'll never thirst. You'll find satisfaction for your spiritual longings. I remember over in the book of Ephesians when it, it's describing Jesus as the head of the church and it's talking about the fact that we are his body. It talks about this filling and the satisfaction that comes from it. Listen to these words. It's talking about how Jesus uh, received all rule and authority and power and dominion above every name that is named. And it says in verse 22 and 23, And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. He fills us with grace. He fills us with love. He fills us with his blessings. And so it's a, it's a very beautiful picture of an abundant life where all the needs and all the longings, all the yearnings, all the cravings are met by our perfect Lord, by the forgiveness that He offers, by the wisdom that He provides, by the promises that He gives to us. Every need, 
Every need is satisfied. You know, sometimes I think life is like a treasure hunt. And the Bible is filled with clues that tell us where we can find earth's greatest riches. The Beatitudes in particular unlock the door behind which every precious gift of God where it is held. I know as parents, you watch your children go through life, you enjoy seeing them discover some of the secrets of life and how that hard work pays off and high character has its advantages and holy living brings blessings. And every time they're discovering these true riches, it gives you joy. I think how much more our Heavenly Father must enjoy looking at our faces when we discover the things that He prepared in advance for us to find. And here in the Beatitudes, we're finding some great, some great treasures. But what happens if a person won't listen to this God's uh, to, to God's wisdom? What what happens? Well, it must break the heart of God because he knows that people are just going to have frustration and disappointment in their lives, not joy, not blessedness, because you see, without humility, you're just not going to have the, the openness that enables change. And without remorse, you're not going to have the ability to change. Without meekness, you're not going to have the will that activates change. Without passion, you're just not going to have the desire that drives change. So the Bible reveals to us this wonderful cycle of success. It is a spiritual cycle, a spiritual system of humility and mourning, of meekness, and of hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Or as Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. All the riches of life that come through every spiritual blessing. You've got to want to know what is right. You've got to want to do what is right more than anything else in the world. And when you prioritize that, the blessings begin to flow. So you see this, this pattern of spiritual transformation. And Jesus gives us this gift. And the idea is that you, you need to use it. You need to use this consistently. You need to use this day by day. Repenting, for instance, mourning over your sins. That's something that you ought to do on a regular basis because the sooner that you repent, the sooner that you get back on track and the sooner that you have more joy, more control equals more joy. So the idea of spiritual maturity is the frequency and the rapidity with which we can use this process of joy that he is revealing to us here. Open yourself to God's information. Mourn and eliminate what is wrong. There's something you need to purge. And then you need to exercise the choice to put that away and to pursue. You purge what is wrong and you pursue what is good. There are things that you are going to relinquish. There are things that you are going to resolve to pursue that you're going to reinforce. It's how life works at its very best. And so we understand the Jesus principles that help us to practice joy. 
And the more you obey, the better your day. I want to thank you for being with me for this lesson tonight. We look forward to continuing to look at two more Beatitudes next time and two more after that as we bring the introduction to the sermon to a conclusion and then we'll move forward. Isn't it wonderful that Jesus has revealed to us the secrets of heaven, the secrets of a blessed life, the secrets of an abundant life and a joyful life, and that's why you need to be a Christian. And if you've not yet obeyed the gospel, we ask you, please, get in touch with us. Here's a little bit of our, our information. And uh, we want you to talk to us. We want you to reach out to us so that we can study, so that we can assist you through prayer or Bible study or through being baptized in Jesus' name for the forgiveness of your sins. Our goal is to help you live a life of greater joy. That's what Jesus wants for you, and that's what we want for you as well.